Wrangle, Adam Wilde, and Jesse Blake. Let's go! So what Steve was asking me right before the show is, what are we even talking about today? Which I think is a fair question, but uh, I think it's a good thing to line it up. Shall we? Shall we? Line it up. We're going to talk about why you should all be all the way in on the New York Islanders, ladies and gentlemen, to kick it off. Uh, but also, I, I, there's, there's actually a great story. Stephen Johns posted something about uh, what he's doing, uh, some changes in Boston, potentially. Uh, we got trade candidates this summer, and one NHL team has, been the, has become the first NHL team to accept all forms of cryptocurrency, or at least verified forms of cryptocurrency. Uh, you can get a ticket, you can get a beer using cryptocurrency in the NHL now, or at least will be next season, because this team is not in the playoffs. Yeah, I'll have, uh, I'd like a hot dog. Uh, large Dr. Pepper, and uh, uh, can I get some Garpar fries? Uh, yes, sir. That will be uh, 400 cum rocket, please. <laughs> <laughs> what is what is with the world? Like you're, you're at the game and you're like, yeah, I'm going to – like, you just look at your – do you have the, uh, the cum rocket code? Like, <laughs> like what the Hey, fuck? guys, this yeah. is Eric Carlson of your San Jose Sharks. Come on down to a Sharks game. We accept all cryptocurrency. Dogecoin, cum rocket. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, it's going to uh, be a time. It's going to be a time. So, <laughs> a little bit. Uh, and obviously Montreal and Vegas tonight, and I think that's where we'll, we'll start. Mm-hmm. Obviously, um, you know, there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of angry Montreal Canadiens fans reaching out, and I completely get it. So much to be excited for. Don't think that they have a shot, but I think – what is super interesting about this particular series is the difference between how Peter DeBoer handled the media and Sheldon Keefe, because by the way, it all comes back to the Leafs. Steve, when Sheldon Keefe was asked about Matthews versus Philip Deneau and and Mitch Marner, what did he say about Matthews versus Deneau without addressing Deneau specifically? We're not worried about who we put Austin Matthews or the Matthews line out against. Right. Turns out they should have been, right? They didn't score. Well, they scored one goal. Well, the, play, the plan changed very aggressively about, what yeah. was it, nine minutes into game one? But mm-hmm. did he say this before or, J, uh, before or after JT got his It was before. Wrong. Before. Right. He did say this before. Yeah. Before. before. yeah. However, I was heading into the series, I'm and sorry, I was ready to run through a wall. I really yeah. was. No, and, and I get it. I get it. He was getting his team fired up. I get it. Peter DeBoer, who has a team that literally can run through, to, through a wall against anyone, said, oh, that's not a bad team over there. A lot of you guys are underestimating them. We take them very seriously. Now, that's a boring quote. Yes, it is. But what does that not get? What does that not do? It's not bulletin board material. It calms the Montreal Canadiens down, which it, it feels like um, like there are teams that even on an unmotivated day, they're great. They're top 10 in the league, sleeping. Tampa, for example. There have been a lot of – there were a lot of regular season games where you're like, okay, they are – they're trying 70% maybe right now, mm-hmm. and they're still winning <laughs> this mm-hmm. game. Mm-hmm. Montreal, when they're not engaged, are uh, just the definition of mediocrity. Uh, and when they're engaged, they're final four in the NHL. <laughs> Is apparently. the crowd going to fire them up, Montreal, or make them nervous? Because this is the first time all year they're going to play in front of a packed stadium. I think... I wonder if it was easier to communicate what you're doing on the ice this year um, because you can actually hear. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, So I think it'll affect them in that they're not used to it, but I don't think it'll be a nerves thing. I think it changes. No, I think it changes the actual gameplay. I think the travel might throw them off. That more than anything is going to throw them off. Although... You know, they did have to play against Vancouver a bunch this year and Edmonton and Calgary, and that's not something they do every year, mm-hmm. right? And as often two, as they do. First two rounds, it's Winnipeg to Montreal. It's not too bad, probably. It's probably yeah, Toronto, reasonable. that's yeah. nothing. Winnipeg, it's, nothing. it's a Good little bit Vegas more than nothing. Now. I don't know. Yeah, I, it's, that's, that's a – whoever wins this series, I think, is going to be at a disadvantage going into the final. 
Because that's a that? tough. That's a tough. It's a what is that like a six hour flight? It's like a six oh, hour mean, flight. Oh, yeah. And the longer it goes, the worse it gets. And then you got to play Tampa Islanders, who, mm-hmm. like, I don't even know how long that flight is. Yeah, this is why we have conferences, and that's why they play within their conferences in the playoffs. So you don't have a yes. situation where teams are traveling over time zones in the third round. And when you do have a team like the Rangers playing a team like the Kings, it's in the Stanley Cup final. Exactly. Right. And there's nothing afterwards. And they, like, this, and they put this a couple tough. days in between, let the players get used to it, that sort of thing. Right? Yeah. And yeah. so so – you know, I think when it comes to this sort of thing, it's going to be a fascinating series because this is probably the only time we're ever going to see these two meet in a conference final. Mm-hmm. And this may be one of the most lopsided conference finals we ever see on paper. On paper. Now, I'm on record already. I got the bet ready to go. Montreal doesn't win a game in my books. Doesn't mean they don't come close. Doesn't mean they don't put up a fight. And it doesn't mean that Vegas doesn't have to uh, adjust. And I think what's interesting about the Vegas Golden Knights is oftentimes, and we saw this in the Colorado series, the best teams in the playoffs are the teams that can take a punch. There's lots of teams like the Leafs that can throw a punch. But as soon as you make the Leafs nose bloody, they, they crumple. They fall. They, they, and, and, and there are other teams like this. If, you, if, you, if someone punches back, they fall apart. With Vegas, sometimes I feel like they're allowing the other team to punch first. And I feel that way because not because Colorado, I don't want to take anything, anything away from Colorado, the spectacular hockey team. We know that. But Vegas waited and adjusted and waited and adjusted and won four games in a row. They lost the first two, win four games in a row because Vegas can take a punch. They never get too down mentally and they wait for, your, for those moments where, ah, okay, that, there might be one weakness that this team has. But we know what that weakness is and we're going for. You know, they were down in the series. It looked like they weren't going to come back. They were uh, down by two games. And then they won six in a row. <laughs> the, they, they, they know how to be down in a series by two games and then come back and go on a nice winning streak. It's crazy. You know, so Montreal, <laughs> they definitely have a good chance in this series. I mean, I mean, okay. So, and I, Steve, I got to call Sportsnet out on this one. They had to, um, they, they, they had, uh, they were trying to sort of, you know, promo the series. And they were talking about how both teams had really had a tough road to get here. And, you know, it was a story of resilience for both teams. And I was like, yeah, yeah, let's not take away what happened with Montreal against the Leafs. Sure. But let's not claim that that the second round was anywhere close to what Vegas just faced. No, not had, even a little bit. You had the wild and Colorado. I, I don't know if anyone's had a tougher path right to the conference final Tampa, maybe, but they made real short work of the hurricane. So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, Montreal, they did lose Jake Evans in that series. And Jeff Petrie might not play tonight. He did fly. So did that's, Evans. He's that's trying great. hard. Yeah. yeah. But he's got the, uh, and Elliot Friedman rightly pointed out, he's got his two fingers tied together on, uh, in his glove, and they got a special glove Ooh. for him. And, uh, and Elliot Friedman's like, I'm not sure if, uh, well, if I can pick it out, then I know that Vegas is going to be able to find it, and right. they're going to target him. And that's what happens, right? Right. If, even if you don't target the hand with a slash, you, you target him with the puck. He's yeah, because he's, he's going to be – no matter how resiliently he fights through it, he's going to be a split second behind. It right. always is that way. There's he's going to be slightly weaker. And it's, I, I did say this about Montreal's defense, who are designed to dole out punishment. They look very punished. You know what I mean? A lot of, a lot of hard miles in that regard. So maybe that's what they, what they mean by, by the tough road. Um, they're not necessarily at 100%. I don't know. I didn't make the damn feature out. <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I was like, okay, listen, if we're that it was like a bit of a shoehorn. And, okay. and like, I think we need to call it what it is. It's David versus, versus Goliath. If Montreal wins this series, oh, yeah. it will be the story of the year. Definitely. Like, let's not be, let's just, if Montreal wins three games, it will be the story of the year. That might be the story of the playoffs right there. Montreal winning three games against this Vegas steamroller of a team. 
And this it's is, not to take anything away from Montreal. They're just at different stages. It's a better this is, team. This is Ottawa 2017. That team yes. should not have been there. They shouldn't have been there. Although, man, the more I watch Stone and Peugeot, I'm like, no, nah, I get why they were. Oh, I get why they were. But that team, that team had elite high-level talent, and it really wasn't surrounded with much. Mm-hmm. Um, they shouldn't have got as far as they did. And Carlson with a broken foot carried them to double overtime game seven. And it's the reigning Stanley Cup champions. It's a series and uh, a, a road to the Stanley Cup final that should not have happened. But there, there it was. One thing I'm going to keep my eye, eye on for this series is, I don't want to call them weak, but it, Vegas, Vegas up the middle, is a, they're a little limited because it's they're right now kind of their first line. I don't know if you're going to qualify him as their first line center, but uh, he's, he's centering Max Pacioretty and Mark Stone as Chandler Stevenson who you don't put that name on paper and be like, hey, this is the number one center on a conference final team. You don't chalk up Chandler Stevenson in that book. And, like, you go down the middle, then it's William Carlson and uh, Nicholas Waugh. Like, he's, he's their third-line center. And it's like, okay, maybe there's a point of attack for Montreal. Maybe if you just limit their wingers, then you get – if their defense is playing hard enough, you limit their wingers because that's where all the offense is going to come from. And and there's a, like a path to scoring for them, and then you rely on your defense, which has been very strong over your six game winning streak. I think that's got to be the way you you look at it. But if if I'm Vegas, um, I'm actually sort of happy that I don't have a top line center going up against Phil Deneau because Phil Deneau obviously is a pretty good shutdown guy. Well, and you got Gallagher on that line as well. <laughs> but I would rather have my stars in a weird way, especially when they're Pacioretty and Mark Stone. Like, so Gallagher can't get them both, and Deneau's on Stevenson. So you, you got one of those two free. That's pretty good. That's a tough one because I think Carlson leads Vegas in scoring. So right. Ducharme, Ducharme's deployment Jeff. here. Call him Jeff. Jeff. Yeah, Jeff. Um, <laughs> noted uh, cameraman Jeff. Uh, cameraman turned head coach Jeff. <laughs> yes. Jeffrey, yes. Um, <laughs> He's got a very interesting decision to make because I don't know if it's a guarantee that Dano goes up against Pacioretty and Stone. I don't right. know. You don't – oh, yeah, because you want him against Carlson. That's just a really, really, really good top six, man. Yeah. That's a really, really good top six. And you know what's amazing? Like, I'm just looking at Vegas. Uh, they've been around for four years. This is their third trip to the Final Four, and the one time they didn't make it to the Final Four, they got jobbed. It's unreal how different they look. They like I'm um, just looking at the roster. Their top pair are two guys who were not there when this team began. Mm-hmm. White Cloud uh, wasn't there with the the first group. Mark Stone is a trade acquisition. Pacioretty's a trade acquisition. Uh, Yan Mark is a trade acquisition. Colasar is a rookie. I'm not gonna lie. I don't know who Nicholas. Nicola Wa is. That's, it's too, many, <laughs> it's too many players in the league. He's, he's guy. <laughs> like, like, guy. Well, here's what I'll say. If yeah. you're just looking at the top sixes, okay? So, yeah. okay, let's say Dano, Lekkinen, and, and uh, Gallagher go up against, and let's say it's one for one, Stevenson, Pacioretty, Stone. Yeah. So if you're Jeff, if you're Jeff Ducharme, if you're Dom Ducharme. Yeah. Oh, my God. Got, you did, I, know. That I love it. That wasn't no, now purpose. it's forever. It's Jeff. Forever. <laughs> forever. Um, you've got... Suzuki Caulfield to Foley and to Foley is experienced grizzled won a cup all of those things but you're going against Marcia so Carlson and Riley Smith who've been together for three years who've been all the way to the Stanley Cup finals who are pretty freaking dangerous I I don't like that second line matchup as much only because you you know I know I gave Ducharme the gears for not playing uh Caulfield and uh was it it was Lekkanen in the first game against Yemi. Cockney, oh, and Romanov, Romanov and, yeah, Romanov and, Romanov and in the first yeah. game because and his whole thing was experience. Well, now you can't have a Montreal Canadiens team this far without Cole Caulfield, <laughs> so he's gonna have to take these hard minutes. The problem is, it's gonna be against guys who really have been there and and really got this close to winning. And this year, I mean, if, if we're looking at the four teams left, how do you not say Vegas, even though Tampa's been good? How do you not say with the road they've had, with you know, taking out Kaprizov? taking out Nathan McKinnon, that this isn't Vegas' year from this standpoint. I mean, listen, I don't feel bad for underestimating a team that finished 18th and has had such unique circumstances en route to this Final Four berth. 
do they make it past the Leafs if Tavares never gets hurt? I don't know. Who knows? Do they, nah, do they, ma- Who knows? Do they make it past the Jets if Shifley never gets suspended? I don't know. They don't Probably. sweep them. I think they beat them. I don't think they sweep them. Uh, by the way, I do have an answer. Uh, so Nikola Waugh was a fourth-round pick of the Carolina Hurricanes. He was traded to Vegas along with a conditional fifth for Eric Halla. Oh, wow. wow. Yeah, that was an off-season 2019 trade. It's uh, funny how we initially, when Vegas was like not a franchise yet and we're doing all these expansion draft stuff, and we're like, oh, they're, they have so many draft picks. They're collecting all these guys. They're going to go like super young and build this franchise. And they're going to have these guys for like 10 years, and then they'll be dominant. But they went the complete opposite, and it's mm-hmm. worked out just swimmingly where they just get these stars and these, these guys who are mature and they're playing already and they're kind of the outcasts from the other teams that have high potential. And it's just it's worked from literally – season one like they've been successful because they got guys who can play right away and i feel like seattle just needs to go in that direction as well you can't go for the hey we're gonna get all the young young guys in cap space and all that no just go get the best players right now from all these teams and you might be good instantly yep yeah well and they they did have i mean they were able to rob like a Che theodore and things like that like you know flurry even like the penguins (laughs) begged them to take flurry and they did yeah yeah, Vegas. Vegas in their four years have had thirty-four draft picks. <laughs> wow. Even though they've dealt so many of them away, they're pro- they they didn't give up the pick to get Nick Suzuki. They knowingly drafted him, knew his name, knew his potential, thirteenth overall in two thousand seventeen, and traded him for Max Pacioretty. And they're still this good. Let me ask you this, guys, for your first pairing D. Weber and Broken Hand Petrie or Petrangelo, Alec Martinez? Well, it'd be Weber or Sherratt. Sherratt. Well, I guess Sherratt. You're right. Sorry. So, no, I know where you're going with it. Uh, I'll take Martinez, who is apparently worth two seconds, and uh, Alex Petrangelo. How is he only worth two seconds? I'm so I, mad. I don't I'm, know. I'm internet mad about this. How the hell is that possible? And that's uh, Alec Martinez of Stanley Cup winning goal fame. Can I tell you, like, I'm, I am hockey down bad because <laughs> yeah, I, I, little... think, I think it was last night I was um, feeling very existential because um, – Were you smoking weed? Yes. Okay. No, I was not – I don't smoke it. Oh, okay. You were eating weed. Okay. Yes. Where is this uh, going, you guys? <laughs> Jesse? I was watching. I promise it's us. going somewhere. We've started a story and it's going nowhere. It's No, it's not. We've already found out that I was baked for it. So Okay, okay. Then I was watching the Alec Martinez um, Stanley Cup winning goal against the Rangers. Double overtime. The pop is instant and enormous. Yep, yep. It's winning the Stanley cup in overtime at home. It's the dream confetti and everything. And I'm just like, Oh my God, I'm never going to have that. Oh, get out of town. I'm never going to have it. Listen never. to this pity party. Never oh, pity party. party. Pity party. party. No, this is based win. in nothing. I'm this is an irrational fear. Yo, you're right. Never do me. Jesse, they're never going to win. Jesse. I don't know about you, Jesse, but I'm already in all the way in on the, 2021 2022 Dougie Hamilton Toronto Maple Leafs. No, we'll get Leafs, into it, but no, uh, we'll get into that. all the way in, all the way in. Now, is, uh, is we'll get just one it. question for Vegas is yep. Jack Eichel a target? You look, you look yes. up the middle, and if, their history of just going out and going to guys, yes, they how? always do it, right? We how? should be considering Vegas to get Jack, yes. uh, a, like, yes. a front runner for Jack Eichel 100%. Yep. And if you're, if any of you are yelling right now, going how, like I was, I don't know how'd they get Pe- uh, Petrangelo and, and Martinez Stone and, and Patchetti and, and Martinez dro- and yeah, they'll and figure it out and drop Nate Schmidt for nothing. Yeah, like nothing. They had, you know, what's funny? So you look at a lot of teams cap friendly. Um, they have a lot of free agents this off season, mm-hmm. and it's because they got to worry about Seattle. Yeah, Vegas does not have to worry about that shit mm-hmm. because they are exempt from the expansion draft. 
So mm-hmm. for forwards, they got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen guys on their roster right now committed to next season. Defensemen, one, two, three, four, five, six, uh, and goaltenders three. They got Leonard and Flurry. Both signed to next season. Twelve million dollars. One makes seven, one makes five. One was nominated for the Vesna two years ago. The other is Mark Andre freaking flurry. And the reason they have that is because they don't gotta worry. Steve, if I wanted to learn about the Leafs players that are signed through next season, where would I find that on the YouTubes.com? You would find it on Steve Dangle's YouTube channel and his video that a lot of people hated and didn't understand about (laughs) what the Leafs have going forward next year. It's a good video. It's like a 20-minute watch. You can just throw it on. It's really good. Yeah, I thought it was good. I don't know. know. I've just been trying a lot of stuff recently that I don't think has worked. (laughs) Fellas, how's that beach pod treating you? Manscaped wants to help, especially if you've got the, the bare chest or the sweater vest. You know what I'm talking about, right? Manscaped is dedicated to helping you take your level of grooming to the next level. There are levels, and you need to be on the top one. So the Perfect Package 3.0 kit comes with the Essential Lawnmower 3.0 waterproof cordless body trimmer and a ton of other liquid formulations to round out your grooming routine. This is the best trimmer on the market for those of you, like me, who need a chest shave. See? My chest, and I shaved mine down a little bit there. See? Looks good. Now, the third-generation trimmer features a cutting-edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents which as you know are very very important and if you subscribe to the perfect package you get a new blade refill for your lawnmower every three months delivered right to your door and for a limited time subscribers get two free gifts the shed travel bag and a patented set of high performance chafe reducing manscaped boxers get 20 percent off and free shipping with the code dangle at manscaped.com do yourself a favor always use the right tools for the job 20 percent off Free shipping, manscaped.com, code word, dangle. Okay, but, can we talk about why it's time to be all the way in on the New York Islanders, guys? I thought you were about to it. say the Leafs. I was about to quit the show. No. I was, I was about to uh, – why? Okay, so first off, first off, they win yesterday. Mm-hmm. And they win in New York Islanders fashion. They, they smother. They bore. Now, Islanders fans are going to be upset about that. I'm sorry, but to the rest of the NHL who doesn't regularly cheer for, cheer for your team, the style of play is boring, but it's extremely effective. Look at what happened in game one. I thought I nailed it last show. Like, it's a style that you watch if you want to learn about hockey. Yeah. But if you, you want to have a f- Saturday with some friends and have a bunch of beers and shut your brain off and just relax, mm-hmm. it's not that style. The, the key for me here is John Cooper. Yes. He said, it's frustrating to lose, but this team is no different than the team we basically played in the bubble – we just made too many mistakes, unforced errors. Mm-hmm. Managing the puck is a big thing against this team. And doesn't that just sum up the entire Islander road to the conference finals right now? Oh, okay. yeah. But if, but if you're Tampa, you should be very happy with if you, if, about the loss. Like, if you ever – if you lose a game, like, that's the best way to lose it. Because yeah. – yeah. Victor Hedman, he's not looked good. He's got 27 shots in the entire playoffs, and zero of them have gone in for goals. He's over uh, during the playoffs. Um, Stamkos had the terrible turnover that led to the first goal. The second goal is a clear shot that beats Vasilevsky, like through under the blocker. It's just a clear shot. So there's two bad goals there. If you mm-hmm. erase those two, it's 0-0. Zero, zero. Um, and then they score on the six on five or six on four it was. And then they had um, zero, ru- zero chances off of the rush. It was, it was zero to nine in favor of the Islanders. So Tampa p- played their probably worst game possible. And it was, only, it was still only 2-1. On five on five, all they did was cause mistakes. And they couldn't get anything going versus the Islanders. On the power play, they looked incredible. And they scored on one eventually. Because they're Tampa. Because they're, <laughs> they're Tampa and you can't yeah. stop on the power play. But if you, if you want to lose a game, that's how you want to lose it. Where it's everything kind of goes wrong for Tampa. And if you just clean it up exactly as John Cooper said, then you're going to be in a pretty good position to win four games in this series. Here's, here's the problem there, Jesse. You're, you're talking about how to take goals away from the Islanders, which you can do. Mm-hmm. You can do it. Tampa knows how to do it. They did it last year. They can do it. You can take goals away from the New York Islanders. How do you 
get them. By limiting your own mistakes and playing better five on five. Plus, I don't think um, you're going to be able to stop them on the power play. If there are penalties, which there are going to be, even though the refs have, for some reason, put away their whistles in a couple of these series and there's just been no penalties called throughout the entire games, I don't think that's going to keep up. And if Tampa gets a couple chances all in that game, like even if you don't take away the two goals for the Islanders, if you leave those two, I'm going to bet on Tampa scoring more than two goals per game. I mean, it's a solid bet. Yeah. Uh, okay. And I could also Fair. So let me, let me say this. Okay. For well, first off, guys, we already know from the Boston series that the Islanders get all the calls and Boston gets none. So that's probably what's going to happen <laughs> here. The New York Saints will York continue Saints. to march in. It's Number just a, such a great chant. It's like, so great. Oh, awesome. my God. It's awesome perfect. Can, here, can, can, I, can I? Can I? Here's, here's what's going to happen. Okay. <laughs> all playoffs. Adam, it's going to be. You're the second point. No, 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 it's no. okay, Steve. Let Steve take it. It's all right. I'll come back. Okay. All throughout this series, New York Saints, New York Saints. All throughout the Stanley Cup final, New York Saints, New York Saints. Final minute, you're counting down the clock as the New York Islanders are about to win the Stanley Cup. New York champs. New no, York. New I like York that too. I'm telling you. Watch. Yo. Okay. If by the way, underrated storyline here, but you know it's going to show up in like the New York Post. Um, if the Islanders do win the cup this year, that is going to grate on the Rangers something fierce. So the, the guys Rangers. that, yeah, well, That's think about it. That's not where I thought you were going at all. Well, no, mm. think about that. First off, there's the, there's the rivalry, but if the, if the, if they hadn't fired the people they already fired, they'd be fired. Like that's one of those things where I think it's like, because the Rangers went out and spent huge money outbid the Islanders for Panarin. and they thought this was the big step forward year and it was a disaster. There was a lot of disasters and probably ones that could have been avoided had you traded certain personalities and maybe dealt with things a little bit differently, despite the fact that I am 100% on the Rangers' side when it came to the end of the season, the whole Tom Wilson thing. I'm just saying, the Rangers-Islanders thing in New York, because media is not fair. It's not what it's about. Um, are, they're, it's going to come up. I'm just throwing that out there. It will, will, will come up. Now, I want to mention two stats here that I think are the entire game, if I can. Mm -hmm. All right? Boring stats, no one gives a shit. But I think it's interesting because Tampa has home ice advantage, do they not? They just lost it. They just lost it, right. Well, Once you lose they a game start. at home, you lose home advantage. Right, home but you start in Tampa, right? Yes. So usually when you start in a, in a particular city, you expect the stats for any particular team to, to slant a little that team's way because it's a local person that usually takes the stats in those cities. So we saw, what do we see in... It, with Montreal and Toronto, I think the first game Montreal had like 56 hits or something oh, like that. Right. And it was like the some hit outrageous. Counter, the that, hit counter for the Islanders has been notorious for years. Crazy. Yeah. And again, like some of these things like hit stats, who cares really? But on this, these stats are ones that I think are on it. You, you can't really, um, you can't really go against these stats. So face-offs won. Mm -hmm. Tampa won 18. The Islanders won 28. That's, That's going to cause a that's going to cause a lot of unforced errors, to use the mm -hmm. tennis term and use the term from John Cooper. The other one, and here's where the unforced errors are, giveaways. Islanders had one giveaway the entire game, and that's in Tampa's building with their person counting it, the Lightning at seven. Oh. And like oh. eye test-wise, it lines up. Like if you, if you say that and you're like, oh, yeah, after the game, that makes total, total sense. It's probably seven to one. It's okay. just... Do you, do you, like, I, I'm with you, Jesse. I think if you're, the, if you're the Lightning, you're okay with this loss because, like, well, sometimes you lose games. It's not like we played terribly. Vasilevsky still had 30 shots, 30 saves. It was fine. But I, I would have that little seed of doubt. This New York Islanders team is, they're, they're like a boa constrictor. That's the best way I can describe them. Yeah, if it happens again, you're very worried. Yeah. Last year, Tampa, I mean, they, I, I watched that series uh, I'm not going to lie, begrudgingly, mm -hmm. um, because Tampa matched the Islanders' boringness. Yep. Like, okay. Yep. Like, it's, it's the – imagine um, – remember when Guy Boucher's Lightning took on the Philadelphia Flyers and the Flyers just stood there? And wouldn't let them do their stupid little. I can honestly say I don't remember that. I, I three one. You don't remember that? No. What year was that? 
um, 2008. It was basically, I think it was the Flyers humiliated the Lightning because they just, all they did was circle the neutral zone. They would not attack the guy who was in his own zone and they just stood there and the fans started to boo and everything. They were basically making a mockery of this one, three, one style. I think it was imagine that for four to seven games. <laughs> like I just, I not that the Islanders are Guy Boucher levels of that. They're mm-hmm. not, they're not. Um, but it's just, it's not shut your brain off hockey. There you go. There you go. And and like it's it's styles, right? If they're your team, like I understand why Islanders fans love the Islanders. Yeah. Right? If your team wins, it's never boring. No. You know, like I don't uh, think De- I don't think New Jersey Devils fans had a problem with the neutral zone trap. No. Right. No. Why and why would you? No. You won the game. You win. We had to change the rules because of you. I would, like, but it was literally. it that series was a chore to watch though last year. Right. It was a right. It's just not – if you're not a vested fan, which I wasn't, boo. So It's great hockey. But it boo. is great hockey. It's going to be very, very interesting to see what happens in game two. Now, I wanted to get your thoughts on this quote, guys, because I, I have to say, whenever Julian Brisewa speaks, I, I enjoy his quotes because there is a bit of a um, – kind of a like, a – like he kind of thumbs his nose, nose at you a little bit. And – this quote has to do with Nikita Kucherov and the LTIR, LTIR situation that people will not stop talking about, okay? Now, here's what he had to say when asked. He said, we had a player who was injured, needed surgery, with about a five-month expected rehabilitation time. It just so happened with this season, because of extraordinary circumstances, the regular season was only going to last four months. So he was able to have the surgery, missed the entire season, we were able to get some cap relief during the season, and he was able to come back a little bit sooner than expected. So what's funny about this is he probably would have got the surgery much sooner had they not won the Stanley Cup. Right. But unfortunately slash fortunately for Tampa, they won the Stanley Cup. So they were without a former MVP for the entire season, but they're so good that they still got – third in their division without a former MVP mm-hmm. after winning the Stanley cup, basically without their captain, with the exception of five shifts. Listen, I think it's curious. It should give everyone pause that Kucherov was on the ice for like what? Six weeks. <laughs> and then game one, he's like, all right, here I am. Isn't that now fun? He, now he's going to win the con Smythe. And now he's, he's literally the front runner for the con <laughs> Is he good at hockey? <laughs> uh, he's a little bit good at hockey. He's a little bit good at hockey, but like, I don't know. Who? P- pick a team. Why don't you pick a team? Just pick a team. Uh, Minnesota. Minnesota. Uh, so we're going to put Kirill Kaprizov on LTIR this season. The whole season, and he'll be back game one of the playoffs. Well, they wouldn't make it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> pick another team. Yeah. The Kings. The Kings. Kopitar, we're going to put him on LTIR. We're fucking playing 4D chess here. But not gonna they don't make it. The advantage of putting them on LTIR means you can go out and get someone else to fill the slot. Or keep the guys you have. And yeah, if but you yeah, remember, in November, we were talking about what are they going to do with Cyrnok and, mm-hmm. and, and Johnson, and uh, how are they going to re-sign? Who was it they needed to get? They had to re-sign Braden Point last year, right? Yeah, year before. Oh, they're uh, – I want to see Sergachev. Some, they, yes. it's, it's, it was crazy. It's, it's unfathomable they lost no one. Yeah, because they're 18, they have an extra $18 million to keep guys. Like, that's what happened. They lucked out with, the, with Kucherov, and they have an extra $18 so, million. But you know what? Them. Kucherov's only half of that. Oh, yeah. With oh, yeah. Kucherov, and... they still would have been, like, top yeah. three, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> they, they've got the injury allowed the Lightning to place Gabrick on long, sorry, Kucherov on long-term injury reserve, combined with the LTIR contracts <sighs> from Marion Gabrick and Anders Nilsson. They have but Gabrick's like five something, right? Nilsson? I know. And, and Gabrick, the last time I checked, was in Ottawa. I forgot they traded his contract to Tampa. That was that weird trade at the beginning of the year. And listen, they're exploiting a system that many teams have exploited, the Leafs have exploited many, many times in many, many ways. 
Um, and they're doing it the best. <laughs> they're doing it the best. There's got to be something. We're trading players who are never going to play again, mm-hmm. I think is ridiculous. Why don't we just switch to a luxury to hard tax? Like uh, I keep saying, and at least, listen, on LTIR, it benefits nobody. Nobody makes more money on LTIR, right? Except for the team that can, can shoulder $100 million in a pandemic like Tampa. But what if Tampa had to pay for those contracts and had to pay into league revenues for teams that are hurting right now? I don't understand why there's so much, like, so much of a pushback against this. It's a perfect it's, system because you allow everybody just to spend the money they want to spend and you just tax them and then you right. get money back. And the, the whole point is people think, oh, you mean an unlimited luxury tax? No, I do no. not. What if it was $100 million, but the last $30 million is luxury tax base and you're, yeah. playing, you're paying triple on each no dollar? One, no one has unlimited money. This is the national <laughs> Oculus. No, <laughs> exactly. Even the Leafs, even the Leafs uh, we've heard, uh, could potentially have some cuts. Mm-hmm. Like the, the money, the Leafs are rich by hockey standards, not anybody else's. All right. Yeah, and you just triple every dollar over that set eight. What is it now? 70, 81 million. Every yep. dollar over that 81 million to a max of 100 million is just quadruple. And you just make it really, really, really expensive to do it. Yeah. And then if you want to spend that money, then woo, we got extra revenue. And these guys can build these awesome teams. Mm-hmm. Goes into a pool, plays, goes to the teams that are struggling or, you know, goes into the teams that are like, you know what, next year we're gearing up and it's not something we do. We're a small market. But next year, we're going to spend into that because we've been waiting and waiting and waiting to do it, and now's the time. Yeah. And, we like, know. baseball and basketball have already – they both have luxury taxes, and it's worked, it's worked great. Why not the NHL just follow well, it up? Why not? You know what? The Blue Jays are actually a great example of that. Uh, when Rodgers bought them, they were the, the losingest team money-wise uh, in the MLB, and, and the rules have changed so much since then. I think the Jays used to lose $50 million a year. Wow. Five zero million million a year for a team that was a non-playoff team. So you think about that and the revenue sharing, you look at revenue sharing across all sports. The NFL does a great job. I don't understand. I don't get it. I'm not sure why we do this. And Steve, I think you're right. Why do we need to talk about dead contracts being traded? Can't we talk about something fun? It's very silly. And, and you know what? Like to Tampa's credit, McElhinney's on a 35 plus contract. Mm -hmm. Patrick Maroon has a no trade clause. And they're still paying uh, Vincent LeCavalier in cash, but there's no cap hit. Jesus. Oh, because the <laughs> compliance buyout? No yeah. way. Until 2026. Oh, my God. You're Le right. They're paying wow. him in cash. Yeah. Boy, no. LeCavalier is uh, a rich man. Yeah, go to the buyout history of LeCavalier. It's 2027. Oh, you know why? Because I have salary selected. The yeah. only person with a longer oh contract God. than that is, is uh, Mike Richards from the LA Kings, who for some Somebody has to do a documentary on how the Kings got out from under that deal. They, the NHL just arbitrarily decided to how did, they were okay. Uh, how did that happen? They're just like, all right, okay? not this one. Like, yeah, yeah. Except this guy. Yeah, we like you, LA. It's trash. Oh, so, uh, McElhinney, 35 plus contract. Maroon has a no trade clause. Kalorn has a modified no trade clause. Tyler Johnson has a no trade clause, which complicated matters this offseason. Yanni Gord has a no trade clause. Andre Palat has a no trade clause. Stamkos has a no move. And Kutrov has a no move. There is an alternate reality where this Tampa Bay Lightning team sucks ass because they can't do anything. They can't move anybody. But we live in the uh, – we, we, we watch the least creative league in the world <laughs> in professional sports – we watch them get their head dunked in a toilet by this team that is so unbelievably handcuffed. Like we, we talk about all the advantages that Tampa has. Look, look at the, look at the restrictions they've put on themselves and they're rocking it. I don't know. I think the league should be asking themselves why they're getting their show run by this team. (laughs) Steven. They should be. Oh, they my should. God. Adam, you cannot trade half the damn team. Yes, you can. You know, you literally can't. So why not? You need their permission. <laughs> you need their permission. That's, <laughs> That's true. true. And so you can't do it. So what would they do? What happens, by the way, I guess you can, Tampa could, in an alternate reality, let's say everybody says, no, fuck off. We're not getting traded. Uh-huh. And they have to go into next year, 10 million over the cap and everybody's playing. No, let's they don't say. have enough. They don't have enough no move contracts for that to be a situation. Okay, so let's yeah. say it did. That just subtracts from the year after, right? Uh, 
if they were to go over the cap? Yeah. I that's a there, good question. Like I know the caps are in overage, but like I think if you just spent two hundred million and then made yourself ineligible for the next season, I feel like the league would probably yeah. Find like you. what's the limit there? Because here's the other thing: if you're a team, and why wouldn't you knowingly go out over the cap and bring in like if let's say you're the Leafs and you can bring in Dougie <laughs> Hamilton and Jack Eichel and you say fuck it, who no, cares? They wouldn't. We'll they wouldn't process after. the transactions. You have to send the transactions into the league, and they would just say no. You were not well, then how does anyone go over the off season? Because you can you can go over. I think it's ten percent of the cap in the off season. You're allowed that. That's legal. So if you start filing transactions to the league that are over that limit, they're just going to say no. Sweet, you're being stupid. you're being an ass. Stupid so you can just <laughs> stand there if you wanted. You can be ten percent over the cap, and then when I the season begins, it. just go <laughs> and fold your arms yeah. and stand there and yeah. go. Guess for ten percent over the cap. No, Gary Bettman's going to call you and get you to sh- stop doing that. With, with what? His phone? <laughs> <laughs> Make me trade someone there, Gare. What if I Again. just don't? What if I just don't? And you go fuck yourself. Like what? How about you do that? How about you do that? You should trade this guy. You should fuck off. Look, look at where this conversation is going. Nowhere in a hurry. We're just going to continue to win games. We like. Why? Why do I have to do anything? Okay, they have rules. <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> they have rules. <laughs> You're just gonna then why like, are the caps no. over the cap? <laughs> then what? Why are the capitals over the cap heading into next year? If there are rules preventing this from happening, how does it happen? It happened <laughs> to the Bruins. It's happened to the Leafs. Yeah, you can. You can. There are there are overage charges like that happens, but like there are rules, and it would never get to that point. What is the scenario? Hey, here? It would never get to that point. Well, the Tampa people. Bay Lightning spent ninety eight point eight million dollars yes. against the cap this year. Could it was all legal. On Reddit page, take that conversation, make Jesse Commissioner Bettman, and make Steve Julian Brisewa, and and just and just animate that. Can you please? I don't know if you can. I would throw that on our Instagram oh, in a hurry. I think just... that's spectacular. That was Gary Bettman calls no. me up and tells me how to run my team. I, I don't like you anyway, click. <laughs> like, I, why do I have to listen to him? Okay. I do not care. Well, you're not going to be GM for very long. <laughs> Bullshit, my team wins. It's not, it's not going to be allowed to play on the ice. You have they to can wait for stop the you from playing the game. You think they the stop... NHL would ever do that? Yes. If, gonna, you, if you're going to hold, hold on, hold on. Have the conversation <laughs> as if you're Batman. No way. And you're Breeze Walk. Go. So, no, no, I just need to understand what Steve is trying to do here. You're trying to go like anarchy against the league. Mm-hmm. And you, so, as an organization, because this has to be like the owner, this has mm-hmm. to be the guy in charge who's like, we don't agree with the laws that are collectively bargained right now. And we're going to play with a team that's not allowed to play is what you're trying to do okay no one else is i'm allowed to go 10 percent over the cap in the off season. i'm allowed to go 10 per- in the off season all yes. right now it's first game of the season i'm still 10 percent over the cap gary go i assume there is a rule in the collective bargaining agreement that stipulates once you are 10 percent of the cap and you reach day one of the regular season there is either a penalty um because i know with over charges like if you're if you're um entry level deal and you reach certain sinus bonuses and then it'll tack on to next year's uh, salary cap. So your salary cap for the next season is lower. I know that happens, but I assume there are fines or repercussions or you won't be able to ice a team. Like you might have to send down guys to the AHL. That's a simple solution to fix your cap. Like they might force you to put players in the AHL else you are not allowed to get onto the ice. Like I, there are rules for this. Would, I don't know why you think they never, haven't thought of this. Never, <laughs> never. Jesse, they played through a pandemic. They, you think they're they're keeping uh, teams off the ice because they're not complying with uh, their little cap rules? Yes, because I don't. I don't think anybody would ever do that. You're, oh, you're okay. You want to be out of the hockey club? Like <laughs> you're gonna stand Jesse. up to the National Hockey League? Okay, you're not in our hockey club anymore. You're stand up, nothing. I I'm allowed to go ten percent over the cap. I'm allowed to go ten percent over the cap, and yeah. I did until so, the regular oh, well, season. Right. So make a trade. Oh, I enjoyed I this. Conversation. I couldn't make one that I liked. I enjoyed this conversation. So send down a player. I was telling Commissioner Bettman to fuck off. I'm like what? <laughs> what <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Well. <laughs> 
Steve, you're going to have to trade someone. Well, how about I run this hockey team there, Gary, and I couldn't find a trade that I like. So, oh, well. All right, well, we're going to penalize you. We're the National Hockey League. Like, how about no you don't the nhl doesn't own the tampa bay Lightning. yeah what the fuck? you could they can take away teams from people amongst the other owners it's happened donald sterling donald sterling he lost yeah. his team. i wonder how that works eugene melnick still work? has an nhl team so i'm gonna be rather calm <laughs> I think about that little situation. threat there gear okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah. i want you to call up your boss and <laughs> tell him you're not doing any work ever Just tell okay. him that and expect okay. to have a job like, okay, so so Gary is. Oh, he called you. He get what did he say? Was that I'm not doing my job? Tell you what, we have the best team in the National Hockey League. Here's how I got it to be the best team in the National Hockey League. Yeah, no. So how could I not be doing my job? Right. So oh, what does he, what does he want me to do? He wants me to trade one of our good players because they make a lot of money. I I know. I, he's laughing. He's laughing. Here, what? What's it? Sorry. No, I got the AGM on the other line. Listen. Um. There is a penalty for this, but we'll probably win a Stanley Cup. Are you cool with that? All right, cool. Thanks. All right, bye. You changed his name to what in your phone? That's that's hilarious. I love working for you. Okay, bye. I want you. I want you to call your boss and tell him you're not complying by any of the rules of your company. You're not going to listen to any of your rules, and you're not going to do any of your work. Boss. You, no, Gary no, Bevin but does like not sign the, his the team, the team has rules they have to comply by. The team is not following any of the rules. Or there's a penalty. No, no, no. no. I, we, 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 I don't know what the penalty is. Like, you might have to send down a player to the AHL in order to ice your team onto the ice. Like, this is such well, a long conversation. They are. They, here's the problem. <laughs> They are, the NHL, if anything, they're consistently inconsistent when it comes to cap circumvention. See the LA Kings and the New Jersey Devils. So, you know, Jesse does have a point in the sense that Gary Bettman could just go, oh, yeah, fuck me? Okay, cool. <laughs> well, then here's something you didn't expect. And I pulled this rule out of my ass, and here we are. Right. And then I think it makes for beautiful theater. But I really hope a team tries it one day. That they go, you know, fuck it. We're going 10% over right into the regular season, wins a Stanley Cup, and then sells the next year. And we got our cup. See you later. Who Dr. cares? Lupo accused the Leafs of cheating on Instagram and nothing changed. That's, yeah. That's how yeah. I know no, one, no team will ever be punished for this. Right. Now, let's move on for a second here because we've been on this topic for a bit. Stephen Johns, formerly of the Dallas Stars and uh, Chicago Blackhawks, uh, put an Instagram story out. And I think this is, this is particularly fascinating. I'm fascinated with this subject overall. He said, someone asked me the other day, what I like to do for fun. And I didn't give him an answer because I didn't have one. I'm writing this post because I'm tired of letting depression destroy my life. The realization that my career has come to an end has really fucked with my identity. What I'll miss most about the game of hockey is providing inspiration. So I've decided to rollerblade and road trip across the country to hopefully help others facing their own battles. I'll be documenting along the way uh, to share my own full story because I know what it feels like to be alone. For me, I watched one video and it changed my life and made me want to do this crazy thing. So if I can inspire someone else's climb out of their hole, then it's a successful trip and I'm exactly and it's exactly what I'm aiming for, peace and love. One of the things I'm most most fascinated with is that that thing that he is talking about, which is athletes when their body says you can't do this anymore. I love what Steven's doing and I think this is spectacular and I'm for sure going to be following along. But you got to wonder for, for a guy like that, like, you know, what do you do the day after the press conference if you even get one? Like, you know, a guy like Stephen Johns probably didn't get a press conference. It was sort of like, uh, no one, I don't know how it went for him, but there's a lot of players where they just don't get a contract off. Yeah. It's usually you play your last game and you go, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a deal. And then you don't. And then that's it. Like, it's so often. You know, oh, so and so is retired, and he hasn't played for two years. Mm -hmm. You know that announcement. I, uh, I really don't know. I really don't know, and I and I think it's something that's unique for athletes. Um, like, it's not common. Mm -hmm. It's not common for people to just be told one day, okay, you no longer do what you do. That's it's often voluntary retirement. Hey, I no longer have to do anything. Hooray! but you no longer get to do the job that you love. It's, it's a performance-based gig. And it has nothing to do with how smart you are. 
it's just one day your body can't do it anymore. I don't know. I don't know. That's wild. That's got, that's got to mess with you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, hats off to him. I just wanted to give him a special shout out on the show because I thought that was pretty spectacular. Um, moving on just quickly with Boston losing, um, there is potential for major changes this year. Patrice Bergeron is going to be over 35. Brad Marchand, 33, my age. Tuka Rask ancient. or David... Ancient. Tuka Rask and David Krejci are UFAs. You've already lost Tori Krug. You've already lost to Dan O'Char, which, you know, he expected. He's 44. He's going to be 45. And then you've got Brandon Carlo, who's due to a ton of money. And you've got uh, Mike Riley and, and Miller as well, who need, who, need, uh, uh, who need raises. And I think DeBrusque and Charlie Coyle um, are, like, it, there's questions around them. Sean Corrali is a UFA. Like, this is, could this be the season? I know we asked that a lot, but could it actually? This uh, it never is, is it? That no. the core comes apart? Well, Bergeron and Marchand are going to be there. And, mm -hmm. you know, obviously you're going to have all the RFAs are probably going to be back. You don't have Krejci and Rask, major parts of the cup run. I'll grant you they're older. But is this the year where <laughs> Boston becomes less of a threat? Or is it just that they're training the next group? Yeah. No, that's all it is, man. Um, they've done such a good job. Uh, and I just, I don't think the sun is ever really going to set on this team. It'll set on this group. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, Bergeron, I, it, this feels like the third consecutive year. I'm like, he's going to take a step back. Right. You know, and Marshan, same thing. He seems to be getting better with age. I am looking at them in terms of the expansion draft and wow, they're going to lose someone good. Mm-hmm. It, it seems impossible that they wouldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but no, it's, it's, this, is, this is the big thing about establishing a culture. Mm -hmm. And I just don't know. It's, it, the Leafs are still trying to do this. They're still trying to establish a culture. And I just don't think you can do it without results. And uh, Boston has done that. And every Boston Bruin who makes their Boston Bruins debut plays like a Boston Bruin. I do have a reverence for this team that I to. deeply hate. <laughs> that I, how could I not? I hate you, but God damn it. I respect you. <laughs> yep. I am Vince Vaughn and uh, did not, did not work for the number one uh, news company. Nope. I had to tip my hat to number one, Ron Burgundy. I channel four, channel seven. I don't know. I don't even know. The Ocho perhaps um that's a different movie mm -hmm. whatever <laughs> same actors doesn't matter true <laughs> same group of people yeah same yeah vince vaughn and dudes um they're gonna lose someone good and they're gonna replace him with someone good because they're the boston bruins and that's what they do taylor hall looks like he wants to come back but i wonder if they're gonna get him at a low enough number where they can fit that in because that seems like a great fit second line taylor hall like he was excelling during those two rounds of playoffs and the end of the regular season there. Well, and with Krejci's contract off the books, I, I could see a world. Why wouldn't Taylor Hall stay there? Right. And if, t and if he signs long-term, let's say you get Taylor Hall eight over eight. Are you upset? Ooh, that's a little much. It's yeah. a lot. I wouldn't that's like what that. It's gonna, guys, that's what it's going to take. Then he's no. Gonna go, he's going to sign for – well, or maybe you say, we'll give you the eighth year, but you got to sign for six. Because he's going to get eight somewhere else. Oh, boy. He's know. 29. He's going to get seven years if he goes elsewhere. If he wants that eighth year and maybe more money overall, and maybe Boston's willing to do the we'll pay you a bunch of money up front thing. Right. That's a yeah. lot of years. But Reality's you know, but you know that's what he's going to get. Yeah, Reality's but not by changed. me. Yeah. No. Like, <laughs> Rit, uh, what players can expect has, has changed. Well, uh, who's a better UFA free agent on forward? I grant you that Dougie Hamilton is the bell of the ball this year. Except for NHL by Maddie, who thinks he's one dimensional, but we'll uh, we can avoid that. NHL uh, by Maddie, didn't you make the New York Times? Didn't we see did that he? the other day? Yeah, yeah, I think you got a buy in the New York Times. Really? Like, anyways, Boach something? I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look, yeah, I'm gonna look it up oh just to make God. sure. All but right. go ahead, keep talking. Uh, really? Okay, no, anyway, no, I don't so think Petro, <laughs> really, Petro signed for 8.8, .8, right? 
Yep. And we were really entering this era, this era where the top guy was going to make double digits almost every year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you've seen, you saw a lot of RFAs take these short team friendly deals in part because of the Panini um, or at least fortunately for those teams. But as a, as a UFA who can go anywhere he wants, Petrangelo didn't have that restriction. Interesting. So he signed for less though. Yeah, but sign for less. I don't think I think I said if, interesting for a different reason, but I'll get back to it. No, like I, I just don't think those big contracts are gonna be available to guys unless they are super de duper stars. And he's just not. Um, they're not gonna be available unless you're a super de duper star for at least two or three years. Okay, so uh and can I just clarify? Yeah, please. It was Ken Campbell, not Ken Eddie Campbell. Campbell. Ken Campbell. Uh, was no, very so different. Ken Ken. <laughs> very, hey, very both different. writer <laughs> friends of the show that we've brought up on occasion. Yeah, Ken's a lot different than NHL by Maddie. Ken has, Ken, we're convinced is is that's the real Ken. They we're not sure that's NHL by Maddie. We're really we we still don't know it's him. Um, but I do want to say that Steve, I think the reason I said interesting is that today uh, Elliot Friedman was on the radio in Vancouver and did say that the Pedersen deal is going to get done, but it is going to be three years. And the Quinn Hughes deal, they, Quinn Hughes's people want it to be longer. And it looks like Vancouver wants, them, wants him on a three-year deal as well, probably because it's less money, and it's the only way they're going to be able to afford everybody. But I also think for Pedersen, it's like, I mean, yeah, sure, I'll take, I'll take the bridge. I know I'm fantastic. And I know that I'm not going to get the 10 or 11 I'm worth until three years from now. This is why you got to take the short deal. But I don't Taylor understand. Hall. Taylor Hall is not going to take the short deal. Right. Taylor Hall needs a call. He needs six to eight, six to seven this years. should be his eight last contract. Ah, that happily ever after bullshit. I just don't think it works. It, and you know what? Uh, how about this? What's the number one thing he needs on his resume? Winning. Winning of any kind. Mm -hmm. You want to win? Yeah, that that lucrative long deal is not there, Taylor. You can sign it. Sign it. It's the most important contract of your career. Sign it, get the money, and lose. Steve. <laughs> yes. One thing we consistently say about NHL teams and specifically their GMs is that there's always one out there who's not the brightest. Mm. You don't think out of the 32 teams, someone is just going to be like, I'm going to do it. I'm going to give him the six years. Oh, yeah. I'm going to give him. So he's. You don't think he's going to take that if it's on the table from like five teams? Oh, we're talking about strategy here. If, if we're talking about what's going to happen, someone's going to do it. Exactly. I just don't think it's bright. <laughs> right, right. But I think we're talking about what's going to happen. I think what's going to happen is somebody is going to just be like, hey, here's six years, here's seven years. Yeah. No, I'm really, I'm cheering for him though to get money. <laughs> is that sarcasm? Cheering for it. Yeah, no, it's just I'm bitter from the Marner thing. Like, oh. no, don't, don't you, aren't you cheering for the player? Fucking no. Yeah, I'm a I am. Fan. I want him on a good deal for the Leafs. Okay. Okay. Well, <laughs> all right. And if you're a Canucks level. fan, like anyone who's like really cheering for Quinn Hughes to get, get as much money. Yeah. I want a stranger to be a millionaire. Fuck. Yeah. Get out of here. Where get out of here. From? You want him to sign for eight <laughs> years league minimum. Steve, your takes today are out there. Steve, I think <laughs> I think grumpy. on a human level, grumpy. on a human level, you can be happy for a stranger to become a millionaire. I think on a human level, you can. I'm happy for Mitch Marner. You can I'm absolutely do weird, nonsensical things. I do I them think, all the time. I, I'm happy for anyone that's a millionaire. Good for you. I like good for I don't you. Know. Good for you. It'd be better if you were less of a millionaire, because then it'd be easier to win. But ah, go out there and get some money. Go and get money, stranger. I know, I, I know that you're right, but I'm really hoping that you're wrong because it's the only right. If Mitch Marner making $2 million less a year means the Leafs have a $2 million better chance of winning, then you're not wrong, Steve. But it's a weird stance to take. <laughs> oh, I know I'm not wrong. <laughs> Why is the right stance a weird one to take? Because you're saying, you're just saying another human. You're like, hey... I'm glad you're making less money, dirtbag. Yeah, we're talking like, about an organization versus a human being. An organization yeah. is just a, a nebulous oh, thing that we've made up. I'm yeah. saying if you cheer for a team, you should be cheering for the team. That's what makes sense. 
But on a personal level, you can be happy that a guy. Yeah. Can. You if can he do was both. My friend. Both, both are possible. <laughs> if he was my friend, he was my friend, friend, I'd be like, hell yeah, you, I want to ride you your in, boat. Are you and Mitch Marner not friends? Uh, no. Okay. No. What if you were in the future? And, and then you're out on his boat one day in the summer, and then he sees this clip and goes, you weren't happy for me for this contract? You're yeah. swimming home. I would, I would gladly, if I were his pal, I'd ride on the HMCS. Thanks, Kyle. I would absolutely take a ride on that. <laughs> well, all right, all right. I Listen, I just think you should need to be open to the fact that you and Mitch Marner could be friends one day. And, and, yeah. and just, you know, maybe, maybe Quinn Hughes will have the HMCS gym rules. Like, <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Who knows? I'm just Man. saying, if you cheer for a team, you cheer how for is, them. How is Benning Boat not the first thing you said? Yeah. Come on. Damn it. Was, she was right there. Oh, or the Jolly Jim. Ah, the Jolly Jim. I like that. I like that. Uh, Louis Erickson's been riding that for like six years now. Yeah. Um, guys, uh, it came out today also from Elliot Friedman, who's had one hell of a day, that um, Dougie Hamilton and his agents uh, have been allowed to speak to other teams. And we're talking about here a potential sign and trade. And of course, if you don't already know, I'm sure you do. But like we mentioned with Taylor Hall, you sign with your home team, you can get that eighth year. You sign with somebody else that isn't your home team, you can't get the eighth year, you only get seven. If Dougie Hamilton's looking for eight years, it kind of makes sense for the Hurricanes to go, okay, well, listen, we'll, we'll trade you to the team. We'll get something back, and you go sign the contract that you want to sign. Now, I, didn't, I have to check this, but from what I read, um, and this is for real, Tom Dundon has only once signed off on a contract worth more than $5.5 million annually, and that was on the Montreal Canadiens offer sheet to Sebastian Ajo, which was 7.5. No way. Let me let me let me look this up. Where, where's the hurricane? It's Tom during the Tom Dundon era. It doesn't mean Carolina Hurricanes players haven't made more. Right. No, during I'm, the Tom Dundon that's era. That's not difficult to look up. Tom Dundon what? Era. <laughs> How much? Five and a half? Five and a half. So I don't know when it's Jordan true. Stahl signed his contract, but he's got six. Ajo's eight point four, blah 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 blah. And Dougie oh, Hamilton awesome. is on an expiring five point seven five. Right. Yeah, because he, uh, he signed that the stall, the stall contract was signed pre Dundon. Right. Jeez. And the Hamilton contract was signed in Calgary. By the way, Calgary gave up Dougie Hamilton. We don't talk about that enough. I forgot he was a flame. We we do not. And remember, it was like ah, he doesn't fit in with the team. And now we're seeing the team doesn't fit in with the team. There's more to be said about the Calgary Flames. Not today. Not today. But we need to know more about that. This I want to know more about that. It's not great. It's not great. Now, so, okay. So, let's say this is a negotiation ploy. Did the Carolina Hurricanes and Don Waddell, who already on record is a negotiating genius, and we've seen this before, is this Don Waddell calling Dougie Hamilton's agent's bluff? Because... Because Don Waddell, we know, is a gangster when it comes to this stuff. But he was like, all right, fine. You want to talk to other teams? Because the agent would make that call and go, hey, what do you think about us talking to other teams? We need permission. Because if you're not going to go to eight years, we're not going to sign here. What are we doing? Most teams with their number one defenseman go, holy shit, we really need to figure out a deal here. Because he's really going to walk on us. Don Waddell's like, yeah, sure, call this is, I think it's a great strategy because, well, if you can work out a trade, you're going to get more. Yep. But I think what Dougie Hamilton is going to discover here is what I keep yelling and screaming from the rooftops. The money's not there. It isn't there. Or maybe not from the teams that you want. Carolina's right there. Also, I think it's important to offer, to, in order to get the most from other teams in the league, you need to make this offer because it's, it's an expansion summer. And it's extremely important. Why am I going to acquire Dougie Hamilton for a King's ransom um, and then potentially lose a really good player for nothing in the process? You know what I mean? So, like, let's, since we know the most about them, let's throw the Leafs into the equation, right? Mm -hmm. So, I got to give you X, Y, Z for Dougie Hamilton. Let's assume it's not cheap, right? Mm -hmm. Let's say it costs you, I don't know, Lilligren or Robertson. Or something like that. Or, right? or Morgan Riley. Well, that's an interesting one. That's a very Morgan Riley is a very interesting one because, like, let's say, I don't know, it's 
Kerfoot, who you were probably going to lose in expansion anyway, and you got to give up, uh, you know, a pick and some valuable futures. But then you get Dougie Hamilton, and he eats into your cap. And I'm also now about to lose, like, Justin Hall to Seattle for nothing, which, I mean, I know who I'd prefer. It's Dougie mm-hmm. Hamilton by a mile. But you also got to think about it like that's a piece you're also including in the trade because you're mm-hmm. losing that as well. Yeah. That, well, yeah. yeah, that is half how you have to look at it. Like, I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to figure out I Carolina do, right now. I'm, I'm I looking think at the Morgan Riley. I'm, I'm looking at their um, friggin' cap friendly. I'm lo- cap friendly. The expansion draft tool. Oh, okay. There, there's another team who's like almost for sure going to lose a really, really, really good player. Maybe they don't want an NHL player. Oh, I don't. Yeah, but like. How are you going to – this is – this is so I've seen a couple scenarios where I've wondered this. So Vegas loaded up on futures. Mm-hmm. Because of how tight teams are, I wonder if Seattle is able to load up on the present. And they're going to get futures no matter what. They're going to get tons of picks. Mm-hmm. They already – they have the second overall pick in the draft as well. I wonder if they're able to do what Vegas did uh, when they realized they were a contender, but right away. Vegas had all these picks, and they're just spending it like a drunken pirate. Like, like just, just yeah, first, second, and third for Tatar. We don't care. I wonder if Seattle is out to go out or, or able to go out and spend because no one else can. Hmm. And, and like, maybe, maybe that's where Hamilton thinks his money's going to come from. If you're, if you're Seattle, what a great get. Yeah, just identify a few real premium targets because, like, you're still – what part of the reason – like, it seems so obvious that Seattle's going to take Kerfoot from the Leafs, but part of the reason they might not is why would we claim a guy who makes three and a half when we don't have to? No, you got to pay. You should have to – if I'm Seattle, I'm thinking you should have to pay me to take a guy who makes 3.5 mil off your cap. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I – I don't know. I wonder if they're able to get the present instead of the future. I also wonder if Seattle is in a dark horse candidate, and this is completely offside from Dougie Hamilton, a uh, dark horse candidate for Jack Eichel. They should be a candidate for everybody. They should. Yeah. I think Jack Eichel makes a lot of sense in the, in the sense that you've got the second overall pick. It's kind of a bum draft year. But what's Buffalo going to do? Like, you could probably deal some, some assets to Buffalo. But I'm not saying a one-for-one. One. What I am saying is Buffalo doesn't have a choice but to draft this draft their way out of this. I don't think Ron Francis should be the first person that Kevin Adams calls. Mm-hmm. Frankly, like it sounds like this deal has to happen. So, and you have to do it. And and most teams that you call about Jack Eichel are going to make you retain salary because he's got a right. neck injury, and you're taking a huge, huge risk. Seattle might too. I don't know. <laughs> I think with Seattle, like it's especially enticing because you you get to start from zero. Like your cap is literally oh, zero, and cool. you just load up ten million on that, and then you build the way. And like, who knows if you want to take guys with lesser lesser contract because there is a cap floor. So Seattle does have to take on a certain amount of contracts. If you start with that ten ten million, then that kind of frees you up to take guys on lesser deals who might be more talented than guys on bigger deals. It's they a have great like a blank. They have like a blank check. Yeah. Basically. Like I'm, I'm looking at, <laughs> boy. So it's fun. Just go on cap friendly and play with the Seattle expansion tool and, and then go to Buffalo and go, all right, who would I protect? No one. Bro, <laughs> you can not have so, whoever you want. <laughs> I'm doing it right now. And folks, not good. Here's what I would do if I were Buffalo protect only players that make no money. Yeah. That's what Buffalo's I would say. Buffalo's problem. On no term. Isn't no term. On, Yeah, on no term. You know? So that it, you just get Seattle to take a contract with a lot like, of money. Does Ock Pozo have a no trade? Does, like... No, the only guy is Skinner. Oh. I know. Bro, oh. how did he get nine mil and a no trade? Or no you, move, sorry. If, okay, if you can get Eichel, do you take Skinner? Yes. If you're Seattle. Look at it. You gotta let... We've already had this idea, that. and it's ridiculous until you think about it it might be the only <laughs> way you get out of that contract and buffalo could well they might they're, they're gonna suck 
but at least they get out of those deals. Yeah, because that that Skinner one's oh. till twenty twenty seven, is it not? Oh my god, oh. Like, that's forever. Man, Seattle could could get Skinner, buy him out, and just and lose the four million. And say fuck it, who cares? We got Jack Eichel. Oh, like honestly, or you have a or you have guy, you have guy. Yeah. Uh, oh my freaking Jeff Skinner. You know, if, if if I'm Ron Francis, I do make them retain on Jeff Skinner. <laughs> on July 1st, he's going to get paid uh, $10 million. Oh, oh no. no that's I, I, bet the, I bet that check's going to come with a glitter bomb uh, envelope from the. 7.5 is the signing bonus. Sorry, not 10. <laughs> that makes him more tradable, though, at that point. Yeah, if you pay out that 7.5, then that's a little better. I don't think the Oakview group wants to make that bonus payment right away before they've even had a fan in the building. But we'll see. I'm. Uh... I'm using the buyout calculator just for fun. <laughs> and? Yikes. Okay. Hello. So, so I, I don't understand why it works this way, but it does. Uh, so the, let's say Buffalo is the team that buys them out. Mm-hmm. Buffalo will owe, or the cap hit, sorry, will be 1.4 against the cap next season. Oh. Wow. Oh. The next season, it'll be 8.9 <laughs> followed by 1.4. 2.4, until 2033. Oh, was God. it necessary to be this ridiculous about the cap? Then I, I, what's what with the eight, Why does it spike to 8.9? It's what's, probably to do with uh, signing bonuses. But why do they care? Like, it doesn't matter. I don't know. It should just be even against, like, what's the number? The number is the, the signing bonus. When the money's paid doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. What the thing against the cap, the amount of money against the cap is what matters. This is why I say insulting things like the NHL has the least imaginative executives of any professional sport. It's Gary Bettman, to his credit, has put so many... Um, like every NHL GM, thanks to Gary Bettman, plays bowl. They bowl without the gutter. (laughs) They really, they got pool noodles in the gutters so that you can't screw it up and fling a ball into the gutter. Because, like, if you let little kids do that, they're just gonna, they're all gonna be gutter balls or they frig around and throw it into the next lane. The reason they have, they have, the NHL has so many fail safes that is just trying to tell you not to spend your money stupidly. And people still do it. It's Gary, it's, it's, it's Homer Simpson going into witness protection and it's Gary going, hello, Mr. Thompson. And, and they don't get it. They don't get it. So how do you get a contract like Jeff Skinner's? They're, they're terrible. <laughs> the, the, the executives in this league are terrible. That's how. They're terrible. Mm. You, you got anything else there, boys? I mean, I think uh, it's, it's hard to disagree when it comes to that. It, it, now, I do want to move on to the last couple of stories here, or just the last one, and then we're going to get into the uh, press conference. Sharks have become the first team to accept cryptocurrency for purchases at the arena. Uh, as far as the Sharks are concerned, uh, according to their uh, management, Bitcoin is perfectly acceptable. They... they uh, support payment in Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Urethrum, Wrapped Bitcoin, Dogecoin. Ethereum. Wait, it's called what? <laughs> what is it? Urethrum? Uh, uh, Ethereum. Ethereum. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Five USD pegged stable coins. Uh, which, yeah, whatever. And uh, so they've partnered with um, BitPay. <laughs> By the way, is is USD pegged? Does that mean like it's just based think, on the U.S. currency? I think did they say they they they're accepting five different stable coins? Right from like, U.S. dollar based coins. I'm assuming, yeah, right? Yeah. Anyway, um, Cumcoin is not on there. <laughs> Cum Rocket is not Cum on Rocket. There. No. <laughs> um, that's a shame. I'm sure they'll make an appearance at some point. I would like a hot dog for five Cum Rockets, please. Um, now, the, it'd be much uh, more than that. The Sharks partnered with uh, BitPay, which is an Atlanta-based company. They're the first franchise that does it. You can buy single-game tickets, food, and beverages, and merchandise. Uh, Sorry. Single-game tickets, food, and beverage, uh, and merchandise will be evaluated over time. So I guess you can buy cryptocurrency right now for season tickets, 
sweet oh. leases and partnerships only. And I think that's probably because it's, you know, like a one Bitcoin is worth, let's say it's worth $10,000. Well, you're it's just okay. paying it's a piece a of that. that. Well, yeah, right yeah. now, Bitcoin's trading around $50,000 American. Right. So it would make sense that they would want to make it on the bigger things, right? It, it's interesting because Bitcoin right now doesn't really work as a currency because of how volatile it is. Like in, in uh, March, Bitcoin is trading at around $70,000 US. And then now in June, it's trading around $50,000 US. So if you pay for something in Bitcoin in March and then it's now, um, it's now June, like you spent 70000 of equivalent of cash dollars and now it was only worth 50000 mm-hmm. So like it needs to get to a point where it stabilizes in the market in like the way uh, stocks don't wildly fluctuate unless they're meme stocks, you know, but right now it's kind of just like a, a speculative asset like gold where you're like investing in it and you're putting your money there. So you hopefully you like beat inflation with your investment and your savings. But so it's interesting that like a, like an organization like this is going to be like, Hey, let's take, uh, cryptocurrency for something as as stable as season tickets that's not going to like change wildly. So I'd very I'm very interested to see like if anybody does it. You know, if they pay for it now, they pay for one box, and let's say the box is forty thousand, so they give them one Bitcoin, and then come September that Bitcoin's now worth eighty thousand dollars, and they're like, well, I got this box for half price because I paid in Bitcoin. Like, is that something that we're all just going to be like, oh, that's cool. You did the smart thing. You did the Bitcoin thing. You took that risk because in September, it could have also been worth 20,000. And you're like, ah, I paid double price for my box. You know, so is that, is that the thing? Is that the risk we're going to start taking in society with assets instead of just with money? Because like, that's the risk you take so. when you buy Bitcoin. You're like, oh, it, this could be worth double the amount I, I put in, or it could be worth half of it. Are we going to also now start buying things and be like, hey, this product I bought could be worth half the price. So that's fascinating. Well, and I think you, you got to look at too at the demographics that San Jose is trying to sell to. They are Silicon Valley. They are San Francisco. They are all those areas that um, Palo Alto, like all of those young people who have a pile of money to spend, where do you spend it? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, majority of people working there at the major tech companies are in our age demographic and that's who they want at the game. So it makes sense that they would open this up on that particular instance because they are tech savvy. Uh, like it's a, it's a, it's a brilliant group of people like the demographics there are crazy. Um, and the money there is crazy and San Jose should be raking in money with a, with an entertaining sharks team, which unfortunately right now just the stars have not aligned for them, but I think it's a brilliant move. And even if you get one person that does it, I think the sharks are willing to say, hey, um, yeah, we could lose 50 grand on a box or something like that. But it's a pretty safe bet that over time, Bitcoin's probably going to make some money, right? right? It expands the shark's portfolio in that particular regard, which is a good asset for the business. You're right, Jesse. Is that, that, that's exactly it. They're like, hey, we traded this box for one Bitcoin. And then now we sit on the Bitcoin and we say, hey, instead of holding that cash, now we hold this Bitcoin. And this Bitcoin's probably going to be worth more than that cash than it was at the time. So yeah. like, it's, it's, very, it's really cool. And like, this stuff is only going to happen more because I know Jack from, uh, from Twitter, he also owns Square, those little Square readers. They're working on like Bitcoin credit cards and everything. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, those things are just going to become more and more mainstream. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time. I'm, I'm interested to see how much we hear about the sharks and the purchasing power of this. Obviously, if it's a huge success, they're going to trumpet it. So I'll be very curious to see how that goes. Um, and how long it takes to roll out in other cities. Cause I would think San, San Jose, uh, is in an area that's probably 10, 15 years ahead sometimes. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like they're just, they're at the center of it all. So what, you know, Uber would have started in California and everybody was like, what was that six, seven years ago? And now it's ubiquitous in most cities. Most people, it's like, you don't even take a cab anymore. And, uh, and I think that's the, I think that's going to be really fascinating to see like bigger cities, Chicago, New York, Toronto, um, you know, Miami, places where, you know, there is big money and they are world, world cities. I wonder, you know, how long it's going to take for other cities to jump on that if there's going to be a demand for it. So fascinating. Anyway, yeah. let's do the press conference. Um, this, is, this is why you get smart friends. Like <laughs> my contribution to that conversation was going to be, I don't know if you should invest in something that can be uh, 
that can create generational wealth or ruin your life by Elon Musk going on Saturday Night Live dressed as Wario. Well, that's most. That things. was my contribution. Yeah, that's most. So things. I'm glad I shut up. I have to be honest with you. Based on what what manipulates the stock market, Elon Musk dressing as Wario on SNL is not that uh, not that it's the greatest, but I would also say that uh, worse things have manipulated this, and and far more evil things have manipulated this, the stock market for far less. Um, so you know when we talk about when you're investing, they always say only invest what you can lose. Only invest what you can lose. And diversify. Diversify yes. your money that you can lose. Yeah. Yes. You know, if you're if you're like, hey, I just I only got this this amount of cash and I'm putting it all into Dogecoin. Yeah. You know what? That's your fault. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, if you're gonna if you, if you got 10 bucks a month extra and you want to spend it on a quest yeah. trade or whatever it is, do it. Guys. But remember, that's your 10 bucks. <laughs> Don't go over a, that. Just start it's a gambling. YouTube channel. What? Just start a YouTube channel. Why? Us? Not, yeah no instead investing of investing everyone you should all just start a youtube channel yeah and you can make you can make hundreds of cents on millions of views <laughs> it is it's not amazing. 2007 anymore <laughs> steve we what? had a pretty big month in may <laughs> oh i know it's oh. just listen did you guys see that uh tiktokers fought youtubers over the weekend what? Yes. You, did you see that scene? <laughs> what? Adam, yeah. we'll, we'll catch you up. Over on Saturday, there was a big fight card, and it was TikTokers versus YouTubers. Guys oh, like uh, Bryce Hall was there. I believe he got his butt kicked. And a bunch of he said other- he'd been playing street fights, though. I saw that TikTok. <laughs> so you did see it. No, I didn't know that he was boxing, though. I didn't know the context. Yeah. I'm going to pull up the card, see if there's anybody mm-hmm. else you know. Did Charlie D'Amelio fight anyone? <laughs> No, she yes, she, uh, TKO in the third round. She won. <laughs> yeah. She took on Jenna Marbles, crushed her. Although is Jenna Marbles still doing videos? I don't even know if I've seen her lately. No. Did she stop completely? Uh, I don't. I don't know. But okay. Uh, um, one of my favorite tweets about it: a digital producer from the Toronto Star, Liban Osman, said, "Imagine getting knocked out by a Fortnite player." <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's kind of a good point. So uh, in the main card, Austin McBroom beat up Bryce Hall. Okay. Uh, it was a clean stoppage KO by McBroom in the, in the third round. Are you familiar with Austin McBroom? No. What I don't know who know? Bryce Hall is. I don't know. Or, Adam, you know Bryce Any Hall. Of them are. Yeah, I know Bryce Hall. Uh, yeah. um, I don't know okay. who, who Austin McBroom is. Did you see Lamar Odom versus Aaron Carter? I no. saw the finish. I saw Lamar Odom won. <laughs> to the surprise of nobody. <laughs> what like the f- Danny DeVito <laughs> fighting Shaq. Like, come on. <laughs> Are we serious? It's, uh, there was an article I, I, read, I wanted to read. There was a, um, an expose done on the – the headline was this, the sad, scary world of celebrity fights. And I guess the promotion companies behind this. There's some, there's some interesting things that we might want. I haven't read it yet, but I guess right. – so, so now the, the, uh, the less successful brother um, is now one and one against retired NBA players. All right. So Jake Paul got the win. Aaron Carter got the loss. Nate Robinson, loss. Odom, win. It's a very niche rivalry, but we'll see who, uh, who rounds out the seven-game series. Okay. I was trying to find the amount of people who purchased the fight, but I don't think the number's out yet or if they're going to release it. It was, um, it was sold on a platform called Social Live for $49.99, the PPV of YouTubers versus TikTokers. And I can't find out how many they actually sold. Interesting. I assume it was a lot. Hmm. 50 bucks. Yeah. To watch Lamar Odom fight Aaron Carter. And, and that, if, they weren't on that fight. Oh, that, that wasn't? No, this so is what? the... That's, you, that's worse then. <laughs> at least one of them used to be an athlete. Right. right. <laughs> this is a bunch of internet dancers and prank guys Just and video dance gamers. Just dance with their elbows fighting. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Man. FaZe Jarvis was there. I know FaZe Clan. I mean, I know of them. Anyways, the, uh, the CFL is coming back. Hey, good. The August Rock hasn't th- bought them yet? Who? I thought The Rock was in, in negotiations to combine the them XFL. with the XFL. Oh, that'd be... The Rock yeah, owns the yeah, XFL yeah. now, right? He does? I, I'm, yeah, yeah, I think... You know what? I think they probably need to do a season this year 
to say that they still have value because that's probably helping. It's going to help their negotiating position. If uh, it's almost like the so NHL cool. with the TV rights, the reason they did this season is because they needed ESPN and TNT. They needed to show they had ratings. Had, had it been up to the owners, they would have just said, no, nah, fuck it. We're not doing the year. Uh, but I guess because they, you know, they needed the TV contract from the States, they did the year. And I'm assuming that's what's going to happen with the CFL as well. If the CFL and the XFL merge, that's going to be the coolest thing. It's kind of cool. Yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't hate that. The Argonauts got all of a sudden interesting. You know, right? like, and yeah, The Rock's I, Vince McMahon of, the, of this new league. I like that. I want him to walk out like Vince McMahon, though. <laughs> With the arms. arms. Yeah. And the Stampeders lose every game because he's still mad that they cut him. <laughs> he actually cites that as one of the most inspirational hinge points in his career. He was, they booted him and Wally Buono cut him and he had $20 in his pocket. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, about that. I mean, you think you're going to be a professional athlete and then you get cut from a CFL team? Yeah, it's a bit of a wake up call. It's tough. It's tough, but look at him. He's done well. It does, does The Rock come in at number one as the number one seed if we're doing a March Madness bracket for the most liked celebrities? Yes. Yeah. Number well, three seed in the East region, Steve Dangle. <laughs> number t- I'll fight Tom Hanks. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a fight. <laughs> oh, it's not a fight? <laughs> no. Because I was going to say, like, we're all going to lose when we get to the end. The Rock, the Rock is the highest. I think he's considered the most liked celebrity on the planet. Wow. Like unless got, you're Tyrese. And yeah, unless you're Tyrese. Then in, in <laughs> Tyrese Tyrese's does not case, like the Rock. Tyrese. Uh, yo, man, Tyrese, <laughs> Tyrese is a wild follow on Instagram, man. He's just, I don't know what he's doing all the time. But Imagine so- if like <laughs> I wanted to do four podcasts a week, but Adam wouldn't let me. And I just made a crying video and posted it online of how Adam is holding us back and he's killing me. My children. Well, that's, what, that's what happens when, you know, you make millions of dollars, but you spend the millions of dollars that you're making. I mean, Tyrese is lucky. He's hooked into this. What's Tyrese doing other than this, that he can make money off of the land before fast and the furious or whatever the frig, the franchise is called now. That's, I don't know. Anyway, I can't wait for Jurassic Park Fast and the Furious crossover because that's coming apparently. Jurassic is there anybody else? Furious. So Tom Hanks probably makes the bracket yeah, the most likely celebrities. So. so Rock. Anybody else you guys got? <sighs> oh God, everybody really likes Beyonce. I guess, I guess everyone from that sketch has to be in it. Tom Hanks, <laughs> Beyonce, The Rock. Oh man. Um. Oh. Um. Paul Rudd. Paul Rudd, yeah. Mm, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think we, honestly, I'm really bad at just pulling names out like that. But I would inter- I'd be interested to see in the comments what people say. Noted Toronto Maple Leafs hat wearer Chris Evans. There it is. And uh, final note, uh, shout out and round of applause to Vladimir Guerrero Jr., who leads all players in all-star voting for the MLB All-Star Game. Shout out wow. the Toronto Blue Jays. Kick some Red Sox ass yesterday. Yep. Their, uh, their bats are working, and Vladdy's leading the way. It's going to be a start in the All-Star game. It's pretty sweet. Did I see wow. that they set a record for the um, visiting teams? The yes. amount of home runs hit by a, a visiting team at Fenway Park? Yes, in the history of the ballpark, which was uh, built in, like, 19 dickety two. Wow. Like, was Canada a country when that built <laughs> Did Canada have confederation yet? <laughs> <laughs> like that's uh that's unbelievable wow. unbelievable eight Very home cool. runs mm. it's a beautiful thing well listen we'll be back wednesday with a montreal canadians and vegas result and another islanders and tampa bay lightning game to talk about thank you to the nhl for only giving us one game but that's okay julian breeze saved us and we had a whole rant about ltir so who knew uh so we will see you wednesday hope you have a fantastic 48 hours until then love you Bend over the cap. No one can stop you. The Steve Dangle Podcast. Follow the guys on Twitter at Steve underscore Dangle, at Adam W-Y-L-D-E, and at Jesse Blake. Connection complete.